Good afternoon. Welcome to the Thurston County Board of Health meeting for Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. My name is Ty Mentor, Chair of the Board of Health. Um, we are here with Vice Chair, Commissioner Terry Mejia, and Commissioner Jerry Edwards, as well as County Manager Nero Chavez, Clerk of the Board of Health, Lydia Hodgkinson, uh, Director of Public Health and Social Services, Shelly Slaughter, our County Health Officer, Dr. Demiana Abdumala. And with that, I'm looking for an uh, approval of agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Move and second it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. I'm not hearing Commissioner Edwards very well. Are you? You have your microphone on. Probably because of uh, operator error on my mic here. <laughs> okay, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, approval for meeting minutes from January 12th. I move. Oh. I, I move to approve the meeting minutes for January 12th, 2021. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on those minutes? No, sir. No, sir. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Meeting minutes approved for January 12, 2021. Opportunity for the public to address the Board of Health is next. Uh, we have anyone in the boardroom in there? No, uh, the boardroom is closed, right. so we have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Off. okay um, I keep forgetting that our boardroom is closed since I'm, I'm zooming in, and the guidance keeps changing on that. So we do have uh, public comment and by Zoom, and then we will go to conference call. Uh, I'll give preliminary comments again for anyone who may be providing public, public comment today. Uh, the Board of Health welcomes comments from the public at our meetings. There are guidelines governing such comments to ensure they are appropriate and do not take advantage of the fact that most meetings are televised. Please introduce yourself when called upon, including the uh, uh, area of the county in which you reside. Please address the board, not audience or staff. You have three minutes in which to give testimony and you may not donate that to any other speaker. Um, we do not respond directly to public comment. The county manager may follow up on an as needed basis to specific items. The board reserves the right to restrict a uh, person's testimony for good cause. No comments that are lewd or offensive, inflammatory, defamatory, or discriminatory in nature. Please be respectful with your comments. No outbursts of any kind, any commercial, uh, comments such as uh, promotion of a for-profit business. Materials provided to the county may be considered public records and be subject to disclosure under the Public Records Act, Chapter 42.56 of the RCW. And no remarks, doesn't usually come up in the Board of Health, but no remarks about pending land use permits or similar matters that could eventually become before the Board of Health or County Commissions on appeal. So with that, uh, I'll let the county manager walk through any public comment, either by Zoom or by phone. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna go through uh, the Zoom uh, screen that I have in front of me. So the first that I have is Ms. Sarah Orbe. Would you like to provide public testimony? Please unmute yourself, you have three minutes. Uh, hello, commissioners. My name is Sarah Overbay. I'm a Tumwater area resident. I am calling in again to discuss recommendations regarding school reopenings. This morning, I heard Commissioner Menser address the fact that Thurston County has trended down toward a case rate acceptable for high school reopening. The Department of Health recommendations state that at about 200 cases per 100,000, high school students should be in person. Once again, the education community was given the watch and wait policy from Thurston County Public Health. Earlier today, our health officer stated she wants to wait another two week incubation period to make sure that this isn't a blip in our case rate. Cases all over Washington are trending downward. Cases in our county in particular have been trending downward for over four weeks now. Not only that, but the rate at which we are trending downward is increasing. Our county added just 15 cases yesterday, uh, which would drop our two week case rate below the 209 per 100,000 that was reported this morning. In Pierce County, Tacoma Public Schools has increased the number of days they are serving students by saying the change is based on anticipation. The rate will continue to drop in consult with their health department. Again, we are missing an opportunity to prepare families for this change. 
Again, we are tying the hands of our school boards who are meeting this week. Again, we are missing an opportunity for parents to plan for childcare. Many of the high schoolers that will return to school are serving as primary childcare for these families. Additional days, weeks of preparation are imperative for parents scrambling to make hybrid schooling work. Again, I'm here to remind you, the school year is not indefinite. Our State Department of Health has not recommended these observation periods. Teenagers are hanging on by a thread. We know they're experiencing a mental health crisis. Please recommend high schools prepare to reopen and give these kids some hope. It cannot come soon enough. Finally, I just watched the previous county commissioner meeting and heard so much discussion regarding the term emergency. Many spoke about the urgency and need for immediate response that comes with the term emergency. President Biden recently called students being out of in-person instruction an emergency. I am urging you as commissioners to be the accountability we need in addressing this emergency of students being out of school. We do not wait to respond to an emergency. Our state does not recommend the watch and wait policy. Please advise high schools to reopen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, I have Ms. Uh, Mr. Jim Laser. Go ahead, you have three minutes, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, I am an active cyclist and have been for over half a century. Uh, the trail system that we have in Thurston County is an incredible treasure, and I use it a lot. It has actually helped me to be healthier today than I was at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Uh, I've gotten out, uh, I had some surgeries a few years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better. I've gotten out on the trail, I love the trail. I depend very heavily on the trail. And in particular, I depend, depend on the restrooms at the Chambers Basin Trailhead and the porta potties at 41st Fir Tree uh, and Monarch Sculpture Garden. Uh, not very long ago, I was riding on the trail and you see our trikes in my background uh, and came to the Chambers Basin Trailhead with a rather urgent need for a toilet. I got there and the doors were locked, closed for maintenance. That doesn't work. I'm, I'm kind of an old guy and perhaps Commissioner Edwards can explain this to you all sometimes. But <laughs> my age when you try to put um, Mother Nature on hold, uh, she didn't like that very much. Uh, this leads to, uh, you know, a couple of possible outcomes. One is a little messy uh, for, for, for the person who needs a restroom. And the alternative is some mess in and around the location where the restrooms are. The second problem can be solved with a bucket, shovel, you know, a return visit to clean up the mess. Not everyone does that. I'm asking you to make sure as Board of Health, this is a health issue, that when the restrooms along the trail and other public restrooms that the county maintains at parks are out of service for more than a short couple of hours, that porta potties be brought in so that the kind of mess that I encountered at Chambers Basin is not experienced in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> uh, that's all I had uh, on the Zoom. Let me check the uh, conference call. <clears throat> Good afternoon for those members of the public who have joined us uh, uh, via conference call and you would like to provide public testimony before the Board of Health, please admit yourself, state your name, where you reside in the county, you have three minutes. None, sir. Okay, thank you. That moves us to uh, item number two on the agenda, vector response, test road management. I'm going to go to Shelly to introduce this item. I know we have staff on hand. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Shelly Slaughter, Director of Thurston County Public Health and Social Services and Administrator of the Board of Health. And this item comes before you based upon a resident's uh, request for information to Commissioner Weaver. And this was recommended to, uh, to share with the board as well as members of the public 
what the role is of our local health jurisdiction in managing um, pest issues such as rodents. Uh, Sammy Berg is manager of our Food and Environmental Services Program, and he is going to walk you through a presentation today discussing what our vector program is, what our role is in the department, as well as what community members can do to help prevent uh, the health impacts of rodents in, our, in Thurston County. And with that, I'll pass it to Sammy. All right, thank you very much. And if you don't mind, I will go ahead and share my screen and um, get this presentation going. Um, and it's okay. okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So, uh, again, my name is Sammy Berg. I'm a senior environmental health specialist with Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. I supervise the food and environmental services section. And a big part of what we do are the restaurant, pool, and school inspections for the county. Uh, but a part of what we do as well is dealing with uh, various vector and animal diseases uh, that impact uh, the residents here in Thurston County. And um, screens all in black, black. So do you guys see anything? Yeah, we'll still see the the Oh, okay. Oh, sure. All right. Can you see uh, rats, rodents, and the vector program? Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, rodents and rats in particular are um, our residents of Thurston County, along with the rest of us humans. Um, we've definitely seen and heard reports of rodents and rats uh, throughout the county um, easily for the last 20 years. Rats are a more recent uh, newcomer being widespread uh, over the last period of time, uh, about 20 years or so. Um, but we definitely have heard of complaints about them, their presence, uh, both North County, South County, urban, rural, pretty much throughout the area. And they definitely are here to stay. And so um, we definitely need to take some actions to uh, keep them at bay. Um, but we're not going to get rid of them, so it's, it's more about how do we keep them out of our homes. Um, for the mice, uh, in those cases, they're, they are more of a, uh, you know, country mouse kind of concern, uh, and deer mice in particular are carriers of hantavirus, so it's a respiratory disease that's been around for a while, um, and, and we have issues with them because the, the disease is spread by exposure to their urine and feces. Uh, and so if you have lots of mice in say a cabin or an outbuilding and, and you go and you clean all that out, sweep all that out and, and basically stir all that up and then breathe that in, then you could potentially end up with the disease. Um, fortunately, there's very few cases in Washington state. There's one to five cases of hantavirus a year throughout the state, but the disease also has about half the people that do get it uh, do die of it. So it can be very serious for a small number of people. Um, so we do our best to kind of keep, uh, again, the mice out of our homes and out of where we, we are. Um, the other parts of what we do uh, with, with vector and zoonotic diseases are dealing with things that are, are uh, uh, more likely to occur. Uh, and vectors are uh, diseases, or basically vector-borne diseases and zoonotic diseases are their animals or diseases that come from animals, vectors basically are the middlemen. So either being the you know, ticks with Lyme disease or mosquitoes with West Nile virus. Um, zoonotic diseases are diseases that just come directly from an animal, such like uh, rabies uh, from the bite of bats in Washington state. So our program deals with all of those kinds of things, diseases that come from animals in various ways. And we definitely want to reduce those as much as we can. Rabies is our biggest concern. It is the most uh, likely to impact uh, residents of Thurston County. It's, it's a small problem, but uh, you know, rabies is near fatal in, in all cases. And so um, we definitely want to, to take actions to uh, evaluate who may have been exposed to bats and, uh, and make sure we understand do they need to, to get some uh, vaccinations to avoid getting and dying of rabies, or do we need a test of that for exposure uh, to humans? Um, and that's something that we do on a routine basis. Um, 
fortunately for us, rats uh, are, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of the, in the past, they were the, the source of the plague. Uh, and and they, that came to humans through the, the fleas that they carried. Uh, fortunately, we have antibiotics and they're, they're very good and effective at treating plague. And so that's much less of a concern for us uh, in, in, in the United States of a bigger concern for us about rodents and mice being in places where people live is just the sheer destruction that they can do to those places. And so it is much more of a uh, pest management issue uh, for the, those who uh, live in or own uh, properties. Um, and this is an example of the damage that can be done uh, by rodents and either uh, the, the left picture is uh, of an attic and the right picture is a crawl space. And you can see that the one thing that both spaces have tends to be insulation. And the uh, mice and rats really love that as it makes very comfortable beds for them. And so they tear into those things and create nice, comfortable places for them to live. Unfortunately, it obviously damages the spaces. Um, they can also damage the ventilation systems. They chew on wires. They damage the uh, vapor barrier that's there to keep the moisture from the soil coming up into your home. Um, and so that they, uh, anyway, they, they, the more and longer that, that they are there, then the more damage is done and the more that needs to be taken care of by the, the property owner or, or resident. Um, they are looking for the same things we are, which is a, a good home, an easy place to get food and an easy commute. And if your home provides all three of those, then you will eventually end up with rodents. <laughs> and the longer you allow them to stay there, uh, the more damage they will do. And so part of what we're trying to do is, of course, just raise awareness for people to keep an eye out for these kinds of critters um, and take appropriate actions. But also then once they do find out that they have uh, mice or rodents, uh, rats, um, to, uh, to, you know, we, we have information we can help provide them uh, to how to do to deal with the situation. Um, just as an example, not not too surprisingly, rodents can reproduce pretty quickly. Rats can have up to five or so litters of pups a year, and each one of those can be between eight and twelve. And so, you know, if under ideal conditions, a pair of rats can easily end up being eighty rats by a year down the road. And obviously, that's when you end up with all kinds of damage and big problems. So um, this is how we create good homes for rodents. And obviously this is what we're trying not to do. The picture on the far left is the dumpster area of the former uh, Black Bear Diner that used to be on the west side before the building was torn down. This was probably, I believe, 10, 15 years ago. And you can see wet, broken down cardboard boxes. Uh, there's an old water heater back there, there's tarps. There's just lots of places for rodents to hide and live, and they're right next to a restaurant. So in any way they can get into the restaurant, then they're gonna find all the food that they want. And indeed that building had a uh, significant rodent infestation. In the middle are uh, homes, and this is you know the same kinds of conditions where you end up with garbage and likely food sources, but as well as just lots of places for those rodents to live and hide and be sheltered. And then from there, uh, explore for you know food and uh, and if that's going to be your home then they're going to come in that way um, and the other picture is just kind of you know if, if they have access to either garbage um, or if if you're not very successful in composting your kitchen waste uh, in your yard or whatnot um, you're basically laying out a big smorgasbord for them and this is what we're trying to avoid um, rats in general uh, want to commute uh, you know, like everyone else, they want a nice short commute. And for them, that's about 100 to 200 feet. And so if you think about that kind of buffer area uh, as maybe like a, a moat kind of idea of, you know, uh, between either your neighbor's property, the field, the forest, uh, whatever, um, how easy is it for a rodent to get from there onto your property and close to your house, whether or not it's through uh, a line of shrubbery, whether or not it's on top of a fence, um, how easy are, are you making their commute? And obviously we want to do, you know, make it as hard for them as possible to, to make that commute to your house and, and inside it. So what can we do? Well, we can do this. We can clean up. Um, that's that's a, the after picture for that black bear. Um, and obviously now it's it, a lot of the unnecessary stuff's been removed. The, the 
um, dumpsters are in good shape. Um, you can see a photo with uh, openings in a brick wall that have been stuffed with steel wool to keep the rodents from going in those small holes. Um, so there's seal up. And then the middle two photos are the images of either uh, traps, snap traps, or bait stations, and that's trap up. And then the third one is the cleanup. And these are the three classic steps to take to deal with rodent problems. Um, just doing one of these is not going to solve the problem. We need to remove the homes, we need to remove the rodents that are there, and we need to clean up after them to make it less attractive for them to come back to us. Um, and this is all part of integrated pest management um, and, uh, and, and for businesses and whatnot, uh, this is a part of uh, long-term effective strategy for dealing with pests. Uh, for homeowners, it's the same process of trying to not just deal with, for instance, if you had a fly problem, you'd certainly stick out a little fly zapper and some sticky paper, but if you don't screen your windows, you're gonna continue to have a fly problem. So it's the same kind of idea. How do we not only deal with the pests that are there, but also make sure that they do not come back. And part of that is dealing with how are they getting in? What are they eating? How can we remove that or change that so that uh, we're not creating that uh, ideal setting for them to come back? And ultimately these activities are the daily types of activities that either the business owner, the uh, manager, the resident, are dealing with uh, on a daily basis to make their places attractive or unattractive for those rodents to come in. And that's where the true power in prevention comes from is those folks on a, on a daily basis are in control of what happens on the property and how that works. And that's where we are more than welcome to, or we're more than happy to try to provide guidance and help them understand what they again can or should not do to, to make it uh, uh, less, less attractive for folks to come in. Uh, we do def oops um, part of that message also then is looking beyond your lot looking at the neighborhood um, much like with crime watch and those efforts um, if you can make a broader space less attractive then that helps everyone kind of share the load if you are doing everything you can uh, to not leave pet food out for instance um, for rats to eat um, but your neighbor is feeding the squirrels, um, you know, you're kind of, they're not helping that condition much because pretty much anything you feed outside, squirrels, birds, whatnot, um, you pretty much you're, you're inevitably going to feed the rats. And that's what we want to avoid, of course. And so talking to your neighbors about, hey, I had a rat problem, I have a rat problem, you might want to look out for yourself to make sure you're not having a problem and or something along the lines of, uh, you know, trying to, to make sure that as a neighborhood, um, everyone's doing the little bits that they can to make that overall area as unattractive as possible for the rodents to move in. Um, but, and that's how we can help kind of magnify those efforts and, and share the load. Um, and again, we, we're more than happy to go talk to neighborhood associations or whatnot uh, and, and, and help them understand what they can do to to, to make their places less uh, inviting. So uh, we have a web page with information uh, about how to get rid of rats and rodents. Uh, we have a phone number you're welcome to call. We can also, you know, happy to talk to people individually. Um, but it really is those daily practices that are the key to the control activities, keep things clean, keep it closed up, are the, the main things that can be done to keep uh, rodents out of your space and it's um, if there is a you know say a renter and an owner or a VC and an owner you know them working together uh, are what makes an ideal situation to try to control those problems. We do definitely uh, deal with a number of complaints uh, about rodents that come to us that are linked to either garbage or say restaurants, and we're more than happy to deal with those uh, as complaints and violations as as need be. Um, but just the presence of rats or rodents is not a violation to county code. And so um, that's where we move from uh, enforcement side to a, an education side to try to help the property owners manage their pest uh, issues. Um, and uh, just just give you an, a, um, kind of a, a comparison or, a, uh, you know, for, for looking at the last five years of complaints, about 5% of the complaints that we receive for your restaurants or 
uh, or solid waste are related to growth. So definitely a small part of overall what we, we deal with from a variety of other issues, um, but they are definitely related. And so uh, we wanna make sure that we are dealing with the garbage issues, the, the restaurant that's dumping a bunch of you know food in the back or whatnot, um, you know, that we can deal with those um, and, and help uh, property owners then uh, with education about how to deal with the road center and, and their properties. And um, that is my presentation on rats. I know it was pretty quick uh, and uh, I do know you guys were, were started a little late and so I was trying to um, kind of save you some time, but I'm um, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Sorry, I muted there. Commissioner Edward, you're, you're first up. No, I'm, I'm good. Good job, Sammy. Okay. Commissioner Mejia. Um, no, no questions. Thank you, Sammy. Sure. And, and just another perfect example, uh, earlier this afternoon, I had a lady call with, hey, I have uh, mice in my walls. What do I do? And so I basically gave her my presentation. She was my target audience and helped her understand what she could do as a as a homeowner to take care of these things. She was already working with in contact with a pest control company to come out and set some traps. Um, but it was helpful for her to understand kind of those broader issues and how what things she could do to uh, to make it less uh, less attractive. And uh, definitely, that's what we're here to do is try to provide some education and help people understand what they can do to to take care of the problem. I have a few questions. Um, so you mentioned birds. Are mm -hmm. you saying that feeding birds is is a discouraged practice? I mean, every neighbor, every pretty in my neighborhood has a bird feeder sometimes whether it's hummingbird or regular bird, is that not appropriate? It's like everything else, it's just uh, kind of the, the scale and the access. For birds in particular, like feeding hummingbirds is fine because their feeders are generally um, not really available to rodents to get to. But the typical uh, like column of seeds that you're gonna put into um, a bird feeder, if you just buy the basic mix and stick it out there year round, what you're gonna find is a lot of birds were gonna kick out uh, the, the equivalent to all the Brazil nuts and the other things that you don't like and after, as they go for the cashews, you know, as an example. You know, and all that stuff that gets kicked out to the ground, that ends up being rodent food. Mm -hmm. So if you have a bird feeder that is, uh, is not uh, easily, you know, is rodent proof, is squirrel proof, um, that's helpful, but also, you know, what kind of mess are you making around it? Uh, the folks that are really um, into their birds uh, can you can work with the various pet food places and, and find out what seasons to put out what types of foods and what birds are you trying to attract. And also, it's also the idea of trying to give birds a snack versus trying to give them a full on 24 hour buffet. But any of that excess, that's the problem. And so if you see lots of excess and you might want to think about how to make that work, if nothing else, how can you move that bird feeder further away from your house so that you're not leading the rodents right to your front door with a bunch of food on the ground? So it's not that you can't feed birds. It's just you got to be a little more smarter than just laying out a big buffet. Um, it's the same thing with putting out uh, pet food. You know, pet food out during the day is fine. Pull it in at night so you're not feeding the rats, the raccoons, the possums. You know, we're, not, we're trying to make that less attractive. You said, thank you. You said that some people are um, <laughs> calling, you know, oh, there's a rat. That's not a violation of county code. What, what would be a violation of county code? What would be an example? Like you showed us that picture of Black Bear Diner. Is that having trash everywhere? I mean, I don't know what our county code covers and doesn't cover. Yeah, so, so those two pictures, one of a house with uh, bags of garbage just sitting out and not getting collected, not being stored properly, or uh, the dumpster area for the restaurant. Um, the dumpster area, we can easily go through uh, from a food safety perspective um, because part of that food code deals with um, vectors and deals with you know insects and vermin and whatnot and how to make sure that that restaurant's not attractive. And so making sure that they are dealing with their waste, that it's appropriately contained and taken away and cleaned up afterwards, that's all things that we can deal with. On the resident side, um, it's a solid waste violation to not appropriately <laughs> disposed of your waste and taking bag garbage and just leaving it in the backyard for the rodents to get into is not 
uh, is not the, the way to go. And so that could also be a solid waste violation. In those cases, we get those complaints and um, staff go from environmental health and go talk to the person and, you know, and there we, we start off with the education. Hey, this is not the way we need to handle this. This is why, and here's your options and work with them to try to, you know, resolve the problem. Um, but in both of those cases, either from the solid waste or the restaurant side, we can definitely uh, have enforcement tools to deal with it. But if it's just a complaint that says, um, there's rats in my neighbor's yard and they're coming over to my place, and I want you to do something as the county, there we have very little uh, enforcement tools to deal with just the presence of rats. Right. Okay. My last question here is about policy. So it was suggested to me that there are policy choices that jurisdictions make whether it's, you know, whether it's, and I don't know what all the range of them are. The two I remember him talking about were chickens in like urban, dense urban areas, like what rules you have about chicken coops and stuff, and then composting guidelines. Those are two like policy, like where there's a, a range of choices and juris different jurisdictions might have stricter or looser rules and that that can contribute to, now you didn't mention either of those things in terms of, of, of what you think the main uh, drivers are, but are there choices that you know the, the board should think about, or that we should look around and see how other folks are doing things that make, might make the problem better? Um, I think that you can. I, I think um, you will likely get better benefit from educational um, efforts because no one wants the rats, you know. So that's a good selling point that if you either have a backyard flock or you're trying to compost your own food, um, us being able to say, here's some guidelines to make this work better and not attract rats uh, can be a pretty effective message without the need for an actual ordinance to control those activities. Um, because there are a variety of other activities that we have that um, will, will also make it attractive for rodents. And uh, you're probably gonna get a better, uh, better return on investment, basically an effort by trying to provide that education to folks about, hey, if you're interested in a backyard flock, here's how to do it well, and have a bunch of information about how to keep the birds healthy, how to shelter them. And part of that message could be, um, don't get rats by making sure that you don't feed them in excess or feed them in this way so you don't have a bunch out on the ground. You know, Those kinds of uh, communications will probably be far more effective than trying to create a, a backyard poultry policy that's going to deal with it um, to that level of specificity. Uh, and the same thing with composting, um, trying to provide people with uh, information about how to do it correctly so that you end up with enough heat to break the food down and to kill the pathogens and also not make it uh, a food source for any other vermin that might come in. Okay, thanks, Sam. Anything else from the board before we let Sam go? No, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Let's move to item number three, Board of Health Members Health-Related Activities. Thank you. With Commissioner Edwards, if he has anything he needs to report. No, everything was to do with the COVID that kept me going, whether it's get back in school or get shots or whatever it was. So that, that was my whole activity around health. Um, yes, this weekend I attended on Sunday uh, the um, South Sound uh, vaccination event in Lacey, uh, and I saw Dr. A and, and Shelly there. Um, and again, I just want to give a huge shout out to Brian Windrop um, and his staff for, for helping out and facilitating this for us. Um, they got a hold of uh, many seniors who didn't have access to technology and they filled out the forms for them and uh, they worked with inner city transit to, to get them to the location. So uh, I thought it was very successful. I was very happy to see uh, just everyone in, in such a great mood. And um, I, I wanna give a huge shout out to our staff. Uh, they were uh, very, uh, very gracious to everyone, very optimistic, uh, very positive, and uh, they were giving great service to everyone. Uh, the lines were uh, quite, went quite quickly, so that was great, good to see. Uh, not a lot of people waiting for a long time. Um, 
and also, uh, I was going to say something, <laughs> uh, something else, and, and I just, I wasn't there in the afternoon. I was there just for the morning shift, um, so I'm not sure how, how, once it started raining, how it went, but while it was sunny, it was, it was cold, but the line was moving quickly, so uh, thank you to uh, all the staff and, and Shelly and Dr. A. I saw Dr. A in action. We had uh, a gentleman who fell down and, and she was quick to jump on and uh, get his hand wrapped up. So it was great to see. Great, thank you. Uh, the, only, the only real activity uh, specific that I have to report is I met with uh, the 22nd District State Legislators about some of the health bills that are before the legislature and getting their perspective on some of them, the pros and cons. And then with Shelly, we met with uh, the uh, member of Olympia School Board about some of the issues related to vaccination. Oh, and I did my, um, as, I read, as I said this morning, I did an interview for Thurston County Media as the chair of Board of Health regarding the Stay Healthy Thurston County show. And that's something that the public can watch. It's a 17 minutes interview on just the topics about COVID-19 and um, that was pretty fun to do. And uh, that was it for me. So let's go to item four, health officer's report with Dr. Alphamal. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, first, I wanted to take a moment and just say thank you to the citizens who came and spoke to us and shared their concerns, um, as well as their comments and perspectives. Um, I wanted to take a moment um, and share a little bit about vaccine. It was wonderful um, to see Commissioner Mejia at our South Sound uh, Senior Center event. Um, and the, the afternoon did go very well, um, even, even with the rain. Um, in terms, I did want to speak to our community a little bit about vaccine more broadly. Um, we currently have two, two safe and effective vaccines available, the Pfizer and the Moderna. There is a Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is in the pipeline that is applied for um, emergency use authorization through the FDA. So we're still, so the, so at the federal level, they're still working on, on the data and crunching the numbers on that. Um, it has been tested as a one-shot regimen. Um, so lots of exciting things in the pipeline. Um, I did wanna speak a little bit about vaccine supply um, so Washington State gets approximately 100,000 doses each week, and we do, as a state, have about 1.7 million folks um, in tier, uh, in phase 1B, tier 1 to vaccinate. So it is going to take us some time um, to work through and offer vaccine um, to, ev to everyone who, uh, who wants it in that tier. Um, in Thurston County, um, there are about 70,000 folks that meet um, that, that meet that qualification. Um, to date, there have been 27,052 um, first dose vaccines given to Thurston County residents on the governor's, uh, sorry, on the Department of Health's COVID vaccine dashboard, and 6,120 uh, second doses. I did want to correct a statement I made earlier today about the 2,800 um, doses that were given. That was the week of January 25th when we gave approximately, when Thurston County had approximately 2,800 uh, first doses allocated to us. This past week, it was the number is 3,400 doses that were allocated to our, to our county for first doses. So I wanted to correct the record on that. This week, there have been 600 doses um, allocated to our county and 1,400 second doses. Um, this is because the state of Washington prioritizes um, making sure that folks who get the first dose are able to complete the series and get the second dose for the full protection of the vaccines that we have available right now. So there was an unprecedented number of second dose orders this week. Um, and that's and that's uh, that's why our um, our supply to Thurston County is is lower than than anticipated. We're expecting that supply should increase, you know, next week and in the coming weeks. 
um, and then especially as new vaccines come online. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about some news that wasn't COVID related. Um, so uh, our uh, disease control and prevention team investigated 89 confirmed and suspected cases of communicable disease. And this includes Campylobacter, you know, gonorrhea and chlamydia, hepatitis B and C, Salmonella, Shigella, syphilis, TB, um, Vibrio and Arsenia. Um, and they're, you know, and we're continuing to monitor these events and work with our county partners um, in, in our neighboring counties um, to identify if, if there are significant issues um, with communicable disease in our county. Um, we're, uh, I did want to speak a little bit about the situation of flu. There have been no flu related deaths um, in Washington state so far. So all of the precautions that we're taking um, for COVID-19, including, you know, wearing, wearing masks, the physical distancing um, of six feet or more between ourselves and non-household members, staying home when we're sick and getting tested for symptoms and being extremely mindful um, have been helping. Um, so, you know, going forward, we do have some tools um, in our toolbox, not just for COVID, but for other respiratory illnesses um, as well. So in terms of where our state um, is right now, there have been no um, influenza deaths, as I said earlier, and no influenza-like uh, illness outbreaks in long-term care facilities um, for this flu season, which is, which is huge. Um, I did want to take a minute and talk about the coming cold weather. Um, so we are um, forecast to, to start to have cold weather and snow starting Thursday um, of this week. Of course, it's, it's unpredictable and being in the Puget Sound with highly variable weather, um, I will, um, you know, there's still, there's still time for things to change, but the vast likelihood is that this is what's coming down the pike and what's expected for us. So I wanted to give a little bit of information to the public um, about how to prepare for this winter storm. Um, and this includes having appropriate weather, um, having appropriate clothing for the weather, making sure to fill your gas tank before the, before the snow starts falling, um, bringing cats and dogs um, inside um, to make sure that they don't um, suffer a cold injury and potentially even die, um, as in to continuously um, to get news reports either from radio, television, um, or web-based sources, because that can help uh, help fi help people figure out when um, the worst of the weather is likely to occur. Um, as an emergency physician, I also want to uh, mention that safe heating is absolutely essential. So um, never use a gas or a charcoal grill or a hibachi or a portable propane heater inside. These are, these are devices that can um, create carbon monoxide and cause carbon monoxide poisoning, um, which, is, which is serious. So, you know, make sure that your fireplace is working correctly. Make sure that the heating system for your house um, that's, it is working correctly. And uh, don't use things that aren't intended for indoor heating use for that purpose. Um, other, other issues um, would be to make sure that you have rock salt or sand to prevent slip and falls. And if there's a significant amount of snow and you have to shovel, make you know take great care not to overexert yourself. Every so often there are there are um, stress-related injuries and falls um, from folks overexerting themselves shoveling snow. So with that, I want to say thank you, and I'm open to any questions. Uh, Commissioner, just for the record, Commissioner Mejia had to leave the meeting uh, to attend other matters, so it's just you and Commissioner Edwards. Okay, Commissioner Edwards, any questions for Dr. A? Uh, I guess the only question I have at this point is we had comment from one of our past commenters on school opening, but I can sure assure you that there are a lot of people that feel the same way that young lady feels. Is there any reason that we can't be more, I don't know, optimistic instead of pessimistic, I guess, and, and uh, plan on moving forward sooner rather than later. This always waiting for the next two weeks and stuff is, it's killing these folks. 
And, and I think there's more and more uh, professionals involved with youth around this country that are recognizing that and advocating for opening of schools. So I don't, I, I know I can't twist your arm or anything, but uh, I am a big advocate for getting it going sooner rather than later. And I, it's frustrating to me. And I, I think I would have another voice in here, but somebody had to go to another meeting. So anyway, there's other folks out there that feel the same way. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so the, the the recommendation or the the guidance from DOH is is that 200 mark. We are approaching it. We are. Um, I'm I'm definitely um, looking forward to working with our superintendents um, as well at you know as well as other heads of schools. Um, the the 200 mark is that is the mark where we where we say hey we've reached this milestone start you know you know we're 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 anticipating being able to open should present trends continue so that's the it's it's less it's less it's less a wait and see and it's more of an on your mark get set so that's so I just wanted to thank you um, for, for, for your comments and I wanted to share that with our community as well. Okay, thank you. Shelley, director's report, item five. Thank you so much, commissioners. I also just wanna extend my appreciation to those that come and speak to us at Board of Health, as well as all of our constituents and residents in our community who send us emails sharing their frustrations about not being able to access vaccine and also those that are really grateful that they have received their vaccine. We, we read every single one of those comments. We take all of, all of those comments into consideration. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that it means a lot and we're doing our very best to respond to uh, the many, many uh, comments that we're receiving. I also just want to thank our our speakers today and add on to some of the information that Dr. Abdemalik just shared regarding vaccines, um, especially as it relates to the successful vaccination clinics that we had this weekend. So uh, over this last weekend, over 1,500 COVID vaccinations were administered in three different events by Thurston County Public Health and Social Services and our partners. That occurred at Salvation Army in partnership with Interfaith Works, Catholic Community Services, Drexel House, Union Gospel Mission, and other housing advocates. That event was targeted to those that do not have housing or are in permanent supportive housing. At the Lacey uh, Athletic, uh, Regional Athletic Center in partnership with Providence Health and Services uh, and our public health incident management team led by Incident Commander Mark Moffitt uh, the whole entire community came together to make this event successful. And it would not have been possible without so many organizations and community members uh, helping us. We were able to vaccinate um, over a thousand people. And uh, it was this event was supported by some organizations that I just uh, wanna have the chance to acknowledge because I didn't have the chance to, do, to acknowledge everyone this morning in my earlier report. Um, but the American Red Cross was there. We received donations from Chick-fil-A and Panera to feed the many volunteers. There were over 100 volunteers present for this one-day event. Thurston County Emergency Management, Medic One, City of Lacey, uh, Thurston County Sheriff's Office, and many, many others, as well as all of the nurses and physicians who volunteered their time at the end of their shifts and the middle of their weeks uh, to be able to vaccinate so many people. So while we don't have enough vaccine for, for everyone in our community who needs it right now, we're very happy when we can get the vaccines into the arms of those in our community who need it most. On Sunday, uh, Commissioner Mejia mentioned our partnership with South Sound Senior Services. Um, it was our pleasure to, to be there at the Lacey Senior Center um, to 
administer nearly 400 vaccines to older adults in our community. Um, and that was supported by the Thurston County Medical Reserve Corps, of course, Senior, uh, senior Services of Southbound, Inner City Transit that helped get people there, and many, many others in the community, just neighbors helping neighbors connect to vaccine during really, really difficult times. So many people are interested in finding out how they can help and how they can volunteer, and we're so grateful for that. As we scale up our efforts, we're gonna have a lot more volunteer opportunities. We're working in partnership with United Way of Thurston County uh, going forward as we plan for more events and a mass vaccination site at South Puget Sound Community College, which is coming soon. And we also have our Medical Reserve Corps right now as part of our department. And we encourage anyone, both medical and non-medical volunteers to visit our website, check out the Medical Reserve Corps um, and inquire about volunteer opportunities and process. We're really grateful about that. I also just wanna thank our 43 currently and counting um, Thurston County vaccine providers and healthcare workers, caregivers and public health professionals who are dedicating so much of their time to this. We talked a lot about healthcare heroes in the beginning of the pandemic and all those heroes are still working every day and they are more heroic than ever. So I, I saw that myself over the weekend. I continue to be touched and amazed and, and ever grateful. So we are focusing our efforts at Thurston County Public Health and Social Services to help improve access to vaccine and ensure that when we do have enough vaccine that it's distributed equitably to everyone, especially to underserved populations in our community that experience greater health disparities, hospitalizations and deaths and poor, poor health outcomes due to things like race and ethnicity, housing status, income, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity. Uh, it is our commitment to ensure that these special populations are served and are a priority here in Thurston County. We're planning mobile and pop-up clinics, drive-through mass vaccination sites and walk-up sites in partnership with um, many community organizations and healthcare partners. Mm. And we know that it's extremely difficult for people to get appointments right now. Uh, we reported earlier, we got 600 doses only in our Thurston County region uh, for this next week. So we're not able to offer clinics, but we are going to be continuing to share information about available vaccine on our Thurston County website. We also encourage people to please look at the DOH uh, Washington Phase Finder website www.findyourphasewa.org. After you go through to the survey to determine if you are eligible for a vaccine or not, it links to available uh, vaccine uh, clinics and providers in Thurston County and will guide people through the process and getting an appointment, which we know is very difficult, especially for many who are in the 1A and uh, excuse me, the, the B1 tier one population over age 65, where technology can be a real challenge. And so uh, we want to help with that at Thurston County Public Health, as does Washington State Department of Health. And if there's anyone that's needing assistance that does not have a computer or internet access, you can call the DOH assistance hotline at 1-800-525-0127. There's people to answer that seven days a week. Um, there's an option for people that English is not their first language, and that's a great resource. I know that I hear the wait times are long. Also, for our local residents, you can call your local health department. You can call us at 360-867-2610, and we have staff that are ready to help and register people for available appointments who may need help. Um, so that's what I wanted to share about vaccines, and I'd like to jump into some other department items and things that are really important to the health and well-being of our community. We are in February already, I can't believe it, and February is Children's Dental Health Month. This is a really important time to remember how important children's dental health is to their long-term health and well-being. According to the CDC, cavities are the most common chronic childhood disease in the United States. And cavities can lead to developmental delays that can affect kids eating, speaking, their educational performance, 
and really affect them for their entire lives if not untreated. And many families, because of COVID, may be delaying that preventive dental care and taking their kids to the dentist for those regular checkups because they're afraid of COVID. And I just want to share that our dental providers in our community are are able to safely care and treat children with dental problems and provide routine dental care. So we really encourage uh, parents and guardians to please do not delay that important dental care for your kids and please call your dentist and make an appointment and make sure you're getting those regular checkups. Um, babies need, uh, need to see a dentist by their first birthday and uh, we have some many wonderful providers in our community. And for those that don't have dental insurance or don't have a dental provider, there are resources available to help that are completely free. And Thurston County Public Health and Social Services works with the Acora Foundation and the Thurston Oral Health Coalition to help uh, provide access to those uh, children that need it um, in our community and also uh, have a partnership with schools to promote dental sealants, dental sealant program. The Smile Mobile um, can provide a dental care and resources to kids in our community. And this mm -hmm. week is going to be at Yelma Middle School this week and next week, February 16th through 18th. And then at the North Thurston School District's Family and Youth Center, February 23rd through 25th. So um, please check out our website for more information about that. And also February is another important month. Um, it is American Heart Month. This is a really important time when typically at our Board of Health meetings, we would have amazing speakers mm -hmm. from the American Heart Association coming to talk to us. Um, but instead you get me right now on Zoom, um, but just to share the importance of heart health. Um, heart disease continues to be the number one killer of Americans. COVID's number three now, unfortunately. And this year, a really important part of the campaign by the American Health Association is to highlight how COVID has really uh, affected people's heart health. Um, we know that COVID, we're seeing that we're seeing some research that there may be some potential harmful effects on the heart and vascular system. Also, during the pandemic, many people have delayed going to the hospital for heart attacks and strokes. Um, if anyone is feeling any symptoms of heart attack or stroke, please call 911. Please immediately go to the hospital. Do not delay care because you're afraid of uh, contracting COVID. Our healthcare providers are absolutely wonderful experts in making sure that they are wearing the proper protective equipment to keep patients and themselves safe. So um, also during, during uh, this pandemic, many people have not been able to get out and about in the community and engage in some of the same healthy activities that they might normally. Um, there's still many things that people can do, even though we've got this winter weather coming up, uh, we really encourage people to engage in physical activity, um, to, to prevent and avoid unhealthy lifestyle behaviors. A lot of people are eating more, a lot of people are using more alcohol during this time to cope. And that can really negatively impact, impact your heart health, both short-term and long-term. So um, please avoid smoking, work on maintaining that healthy, healthy weight, getting these uh, COVID-19 pounds off as we, as we near the end of, of the pandemic and um, make sure you get your regular checkups. I'm also glad that Dr. Abdemalik referenced the upcoming uh, weather that we that we have that we have on the horizon here this week um, with a potential snow and extremely uh, cold weather that can be really harmful especially to those that do not have do not have housing so we have declared a hazardous weather event for four days um, starting um, this Wednesday and going through Sunday February 14th and our homeless service providers, are working together to increase uh, shelter access as well as daytime warming activities um, and doing outreach events to those that are living outdoors and providing them with things to keep them warm and other resources. Uh, we're sending out a press release uh, this afternoon on that. So there's more information uh, should be 
both in the media um, as well as on our Thurston County website. If anyone is uh, looking for shelter or looking for ways to help, please visit our website. Um, and you can also call Thurston County's shelter hotline at 1-844-628-7343. And then finally, uh, to, conclude, to conclude my report for today, um, I just want to acknowledge a very special person who is on this call with us today. And that is our clerk of the Board of Health, Lydia Hodgkinson. So today is Lydia's last day as our Board of Health clerk. Um, she has done an amazing and incredible job over 15 years. Is that right, Lydia? That's correct. 15, 15 years. And Lydia is still, we're so glad she's still with us at, at Public Health and Other Department and still doing some amazing work. But the clerk of the board duties and the board of county commissioner clerk duties will be combined going, going forward. And we're just want to have the opportunity to express our thanks to you, Lydia. There's so much I, people don't know behind the scenes that makes our Board of Health run um, and the public counts on you to, uh, to get all the information shared with them in a timely manner. And all of us uh, are just so grateful for your organization and support and taking the minutes and everything else that, that you do to, to support us in this role. So I just wanna say Thank you so much for everything that you've done as clerk of the Board of Health. I have, I have this bouquet of flowers for you Thank that you. I will be putting on your desk. And I know that the board has a certificate and special recognition for you as well in gratitude for your service. And so with that, thank you. And I would invite the board to offer any further comments to Lydia or ask me any questions about my report today. Thank you, appreciate it. Commissioner Edwards, anything for Shelly or Lydia? You're gonna keep her working though, aren't you, Shelly? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I've, got, I've got plenty on my plate, yeah. Okay, good luck to you. I'll see you around. This baloney, this, this COVID business is messing everything up, I can tell you. So good luck. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah, I don't have any questions for Shelly, Lydia. That's, I'm glad to hear that you're not leaving us, not that kind of situation. Um, and we'll be seeing you uh, doing whatever else you're gonna do for public health. That will be uh, important, I'm sure. And so it's been great working with you, such as, such as, such as it's been the last two years. Yeah. I uh, look forward to working with you more in other roles. So great, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Shelly, for that recognition and those uh, flowers. Commissioner, may, may I? Yes, Ramiro, please. Sorry. Uh, I, I just like to echo what uh, Shelly stated uh, and extend my, my gratitude and appreciation to Lydia. I have, been, I have had the honor to work with you and over the last few years, so I really appreciate what, what you have contributed to, to the Board of Health. And uh, as, as Shelly stated, um, and you as well, you know, uh, the functions of the Board of Health is just a portion of what you do for public health. You have a full plate, and, and, and the plate keeps getting fuller for you. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, is, this is not like you, all of a sudden you're, you're done. No, I mean, you have a lot to do, and, uh, and, and also it's a recognition for that as well. Uh, thank you for the Board of Health clerk uh, over the last few years, but also thank you for what you do for public health and the citizens of Thurston County. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we're, we're at the end. Is that right, Shelly? Right. Very good. It's now 5.07 and we will adjourn the Board of Health meeting for February. We'll see everybody and we'll see you next time.